Good evening, everybody. We're missing one panelist, but we're hoping she will appear very soon. Uh, my colleague Liz Alderman from the New York Times just had a big piece in the paper, perhaps you saw it, saying that Greece is back. Greece has roared back from the crisis of 10 years ago, and we are back with it. And perhaps that's an illustration that pessimism can be overdone. Well, there's a great deal of pessimism right now about democracy. Uh, there's a sense that the West's heft in the world is diminishing and that there we are confronting or seeing the rise of what are being called civilizational states, whatever precisely that means, and I'm not sure I know. Um, as a different model of society, that is attractive to many people. I'm joined tonight by Bruno, Ma Bruno Massais, who's former Secretary of State of European Affairs of Portugal, sitting at the end there. Simon Reed Henry, who's an author and academic. And Ding Xin Zhao, a professor of sociology at the University of Chicago. Um, I'd like to start with you, if I may, Bruno. Um, how would you define civilizational? And is that word civilizational compatible with, say, the persecution of minorities or the trampling of an international border? So I, I, I've been quite, quite interested in, is this on? I've uh, been quite interested in this idea of civilizational states or civilization states because I think we need a concept to capture the pluralism and diversity of the contemporary world. Uh, I think about a decade ago, most of us started to suspect that the world is not converging to a single model. We have China, but we also have India, we have Turkey, we have countries that in a way go back into their history, into their traditions, and try to find a new way to organize societies that is not necessarily the negation of the Western model, but it's not the acceptance of the Western model either. They are representing different civilizations, and those civilizations, instead of being expressed merely in different cuisines or national costumes or different ways to um, make art, they can also be expressed in politics. That is the, the, the essential concept. Now, I personally uh, would like to make a distinction between a civilization state and a state that is based on ethnicity or race or religion. For me, a civilization state is based on a certain way of looking at the world, on a certain theory of the good life, on a certain political theory. It is based on thought, on reflection. It's not based on blind identity of any kind. I think that's an important distinction to make, and with, with, with both concepts, the concept of, let us say, the national state or an ethnic state and the civilization state, we actually have a way to look at what's happening all over the world and still remain critical without necessarily having to appeal to a Western model that everyone has to follow. It is possible to look at developments in India or in Israel and say, we recognize that India and Israel represent a, a particular specific civilization. Commissioner, how are you? A particular specific civilization, uh, but they don't represent uh, ethnic identity or religious identity. And it's is possible there, to Is criticize. there a line that a civilizational state might cross, at which point you would wish to withdraw that description? Yes, I think. I it's mean, a, looking at Russia or even perhaps China's treatment of the Uyghurs. I mean, at what at what point does the term civilizational civilization uh, become inappropriate? Or is there no such? No, point? no, it does become. I think it's possible to look at Russia, and even though President Putin talks about Russia as a civilization state, and to say, well, the idea of civilization, it is uh, a form of reflection, of thought, of culture. This is what we mean, have always meant by the word civilization. Now, what, what Russia at present expresses is not that at all, is a blind form of identity uh, that uh, recognizes only us versus them, 
uh, ethnic identity, national identity of really a sort of blood and soil type that has nothing that deserves the name civilization. So I think the concept, does, just to, to, to reinforce this point, I think the concept does not necessitate that we accept everything. Okay. Um, I would like to welcome uh, Jutta Upilainen, um, who has just arrived in Athens and who is the EU Commissioner for International Partnerships. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's become fashionable to badmouth democracies with their fierce attachment to individual freedom, to the rule of law, to a free press, which particularly concerns us, and to predict some kind of takeover or at least rise to equal power and influence of these so-called civilizational states like Russia and China. Do you buy that argument? Is what? the glow of democracy fading and we're heading into a darker world? Well, um, first of all, it's great to be in Athens and, and, and greetings uh, from, from Brussels. Um, I personally think that democracy needs allies. And from my perspective, being the Commissioner for International Partnerships in the European Union, I think the best allies for democracy are young people and youth. If we look at the uh, demographics, for instance in Africa, we have a continent with 1.3 billion citizens, and over 60% of those citizens are below 25 years old. So they are youth and, and, and young people. It's a continent that just had five or six coups in the last... Indeed. <laughs> and, and, and my theory is that actually, of course, we can discuss that what is the reason for these coups, but my personal perception is that one reason for those coups actually is anger. That people are really frustrated. People are ang angry. If you look at, for instance, Niger, or if you look at Sahelian countries, the whole region, uh, over half of the population in those countries are below 15 years old. So they are really kids and teenagers. Without any opportunities, without any prospects for their life. And that's why I personally believe that if we want to defend democracy, and definitely this is something what the European Union is doing, we are the biggest democracy uh, funder, democracy effects, uh, efforts funder globally, 1.5 billion euros, the latest program for that. Uh, we have to empower and invest in young people. And this is my personal priority as a commissioner. We have to educate them, and through the education we have to uh, empower them, but we also have to pave the way to be part of society, you know, to be visible and give their uh, chances to participate. And this is what we do, for instance, with our nude uh, women and youth in democracy initiative. So I personally believe that democracy will prevail, but it has to be, uh, it has to be done through the young generation. But do you believe liberal societies are directly threatened by the rise of autocratic models as we see in Moscow and Beijing, for example? I mean, these youths are, you know, all very well, but there are two major powers right now that are directly confronting the West and its model. How threatening is that to you as the EU commissioner for um, international partnerships? It is, because of course, if I look at Africa, which is uh, part of my responsibility, of course we see that Africa is a kind of a geopolitical hotspot. You know, all the global actors are there, right. including Russia, including China. Mm -hmm. And of course, for instance, Russia is very, very aggressively uh, spreading its propaganda and disinformation. And we can also see probably some links uh, between Russia and these military coups, for instance, in Sahelian countries. Maybe. So, uh, so definitely this is, uh, I would say, a risk. This is a real threat. And that's why I think we have to, we, I think from the European perspective, this kind of option that we 
we, we leave the Sahelian states, that you know, we, leave, we leave them alone. This is not an option for me, because I think this is precisely an avenue for powers like China and Russia mm. to be even more stronger in that region. Yeah, Russia is being very effective in Africa with anti-colonial propaganda while it's fighting what many would regard as a colonial war. So that's a pretty clever uh, uh, achievement in its way. Yeah? the way that message against the French particularly has, has prevailed. Simon, if I may um, turn to you. Uh, what, in your view, has gone wrong in liberal democracies since their triumph just three decades ago? I mean, everything was going liberal democracy's way when the Cold War ended. Three decades later, the world looks very different, and that's the nature of history. Things change. And what, in your view, then is needed to revive them, revive their appeal, revive their magnetism, revive the way they're viewed in the world. Thanks, yeah. I mean, we, so we've heard a little about culture, we've heard a little about demography, and so maybe this is the point to bring in politics and history and to ask not only where is it that civilizational states might come from, but where is it that democracy comes from and how might that change? And you know. At the heart of democracy really is a, is a paradox. This idea that it actually itself emerges out of very concrete historical moments of struggle. Uh, and yet what it proposes as the solution to that are universal prescriptions. And the only way of managing that paradox is constant reinvention. So I think the first thing that we have to understand before we even ask what is it that's gone wrong with democracy as we understand and have lived it in the West, and I assume that's the we, we we're referring to, is how has it changed over time? You know, when Benjamin Constant sat in the early 19th century and reflected upon the democracy of the ancients, the, the, the more direct forms of democracy in the midst of the Enlightenment, what was being proposed then was fundamentally different. It was representative forms of democracy, democracy tied up with the emergence of the nation state. What we've seen subsequent to that in the interwar period was a very different form of democracy at the tail end of imperialism that was struggling to deal with those challenges and the result of that, again, post-1945, was the beginnings of what some now refer to as the golden age, uh, with their nostalgic lenses on, a, a, an era of consensus when the idea was to take what liberalism, and this is the part I think we need to bring in to understand, what liberalism had given to democracy, which is this marrying of, of freedom with equality. It's a matter of balance as much as anything else. And turn that on its head. And what was required, therefore, in the post-war era to maintain that balance was constrained forms of freedom, channeled forms of popular mobilization, not demagoguery. And what's happened since the 1970s is that the terms again of that democratic settlement have changed. So we've seen the emergence of economic globalization. We've seen the upheavals of uh, the, the expectation that lives would continue to improve, that pensions would be paid. You know, the, the Swedish Prime Minister, Targa Erlander, had a great phrase for this. He called it the... the, the, the he called it the, the discontent of rising expectations. And I think the short answer to your question Roger, question, Roger, is that what we've seen over the last five decades or so is the inverse of that. We have seen core constituencies feeling that their voice is no longer heard. We've, heard econo we've seen economic globalization undermine the purchasing power of the Western lower middle classes. And so the upheavals that we're seeing in democracy today that lead us to say it is in crisis actually are much more deep-seated and they're much more to do with the ways in which individuals feel that their voice can be conveyed. And I think when we get to that point, we begin to understand the appeal of, of, of so-called civilizational states because we understand that what they're able to do is to mobilize identity in place of the public goods that democracy was once able to promise. And you mentioned Russia. Just very briefly to alight on that, the Bagruin Institute did this fantastic survey recently where they were able to show that over the 20 years of Putin's tenure, in various forms. Democratic accountability, governmental accountability has gone down by 14%. Now, let's not worry too much about the numbers. If that's 14%, I'd hate to see 50%. But regardless, the interesting fact is that the provision of public goods went up by 10%. On maternal mortality, Russia outranks the US. And it's that capacity to diffuse what would otherwise be dissent within the heart of civilizational states that undermines what once was democracy's promise to give. Well, of course, if you're ready to galvanize societies with war 
as Putin has done regularly from Chechnya to Georgia to Ukraine, and get people's blood up behind a nationalist idea, something I saw in great and tragic detail in Bosnia, then uh, it is easy to whip a society into, into following you, but it's not necessarily, well, in fact, it's, I don't think it's a path that one wants to follow, because they're already, what are there, 250,000 dead between Ukraine and Russia? Um, Ding Xin, um, the continued rise of Chinese civilization seems inevitable. How do you think it will change the world? And can such a transition in global power occur without war with the current superpower, the United States, for example, over Taiwan? Uh, uh, first of all, I'd really thank you for inviting me to the Great this, pleasure. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Podium. And also, and I happen to be, I'm also retired and come back to China. I'm actually the head of a Georgia University sociology department. So in a way, what I'm talking about more actually, what we discussed in China among intellectuals. Uh, increasingly, we don't think, you know, actually I myself never think China can replace the United States in any possible way. Because as a sociologist, we see that uh, if, you if you measure the power of the empire, or power of the state, and uh, you measure by its economic power. In a way, it's what they produce, what they invent. You measure by the culture ideological power that they produce, how Hollywood, including academics, you know, impact the rest of the world. You including the politics, how they can produce a norm or regulation that people to follow. Or militarily, how many military you know, machines they have. So China had nothing. You know, economically, they may be able to produce, you know, most of my Chinese colleagues would agree, the low to mid-level products. Or they can invent, but they can only invent in a way to combine things. Those we call original invention. And China got nothing. They don't know how. And it's those doing pre pretty well on the technological front right mm, now, isn't it's it? It's actually not. You know, if you, com if you discuss with uh, a lot of... President of Biden the, seems worried. Uh, that's actually... It goes up to a certain point. It doesn't work because real invention needs freedom. That's I told Chinese colleagues, English and leadership again and again. You follow, you chase, and uh, some kind of determining the right direction could work. If you want to surpass... If you want real creativity, you need a heart to be free. You need to allow people to make different kind of mistakes. So you're saying under the current system in China, it cannot achieve that kind of degree of creativity and dynamism to rival the US? Not, not at all. <laughs> Maybe not even India. Well, this, <laughs> is, this is news. Yeah. OK. <laughs> you know, because I was in China. I know what, the, what kind of scholarship they have, what kind of laboratory they have. You know, they cannot even, like COVID, you know, like the new kind of, you know, uh, you know, I'm a magazine, you know, immune say, you know. The, so what is the West so worried about? Because, because they did, you know, China had 1.4 1. 1. 1. billion population. They're a big country. Yeah, but it's not that. It's the dramatic rise of China and extension of its influence and but, Xi Jinping's determination to project a Chinese model outward into the world. Uh, I mean, he's, he's really uh, uh, turned his back on Deng and you know, on, the, on the quiet rise of China. Now it's quite a forthright rise of China, quite almost aggressive. Mm -hmm. Look at the South China Sea, or the East Sea, as the Vietnamese say. So, uh, I mean, really? You, uh, you, I take it you actually believe what you're yeah, saying. It's, uh, yeah, you know, to me, uh, those things, you know, when you look at the Soviet, at the time of, you know, before the collapse, they really look strong. No political scientist, no sociologist, nobody inside the United States or Europe would predict Soviet Union collapse. But you talk people internally, they don't trust their government. There's lots of problems. Chinese, you know... So you think a Chinese collapse is quite plausible? I don't know if it's any forcible, so yes, mm -hmm. but... Uh, there's a, a lot of instability that everybody can see. Okay. That's why many Chinese want to get money out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. um, Bruno, can I come back to you? I'd like to just focus on Ukraine for a moment. Uh, I mean, here we had a, an, an invasion of, of a neighboring state uh, whose borders 
had been formally recognized by Russia in 1994 when Ukraine gave up a lot of nuclear warheads. And uh, Russia just broke the first principles of the United Nations Charter of international law, um, tried to initially to um, eradicate Ukraine, try, in the words of Putin, tried to go straight to Kyiv. And, and yet, and yet, and yet, um, demographically, most of the world is not with the West. Um, China is not. India is not really. Um, much of Africa. Uh, why is it so much of the world sees what has happened in Ukraine in such starkly different terms uh, from the West. When the West sees something that appears legally and morally very clear. Yes, good question. Now, uh, just 10 seconds on this point of whether you need freedom to have creativity and innovation. I, I have some doubts about that. Why? Because if we look at our own history in Europe, uh, Renaissance Florence, that w it wasn't a liberal democracy, and, and, and yet enormous flourishing of creativity, both artistic and scientific. Newtonian England, or 17th century England, as close as England has come to have a, absolute monarchs, enormous flourishing of creativity from Shakespeare to Newton. So I'm not as, as optimistic that this link always prevails. Now, to Ukraine. Uh, I think the Ukraine war, whether we want to accept it or not, showed uh, a kind of newfound weakness in the West. And I, uh, I have only to appeal to what we, what we seem to think back in February 2022, that the Russian economy would collapse under sanctions. You know, I myself on, on Twitter, express that view. I haven't deleted the tweets yet, but express that view. Because that was our expectation looking to the past. It didn't happen. In fact, it was the other way around. We thought the Russian army would perform well and the economy wouldn't. It turns out it was exactly the other way around. Why? Because uh, American in particular, but Western economic power no longer extends as deeply and as widely as it used to do. And we have to accept that. Well, again, whether we like it or not, but it's a fact. I think that's part of the explanation why the rest of the world hasn't come along. Well, because actually now they can afford not to. There's a certain degrees of freedom that, that the rest of the world didn't have before to choose and to pursue their own interests. And then what I also see in India, in Africa, other places when, when I talk to people, officials or, or intellectuals, even, even those people who agree that Russia violated international law and national sovereignty, they immediately add, it's not for the West to judge. So this, for them, there's a previous question, which is the question of who judges. They might even agree that it happened, but they, first of all, they want to create a global framework where the power to judge is distributed and divided between different stakeholders. And they actually, particularly in India, they actually seem to think that the prior question is more important and that they will not pronounce on the latter question until there are significant reforms that create what they call a global democracy. Because, by the way, that's an interesting question to ask. Um, there's democracy inside our Western societies, but at the global level, the power is not equal, the power is not distributed. People in Africa have very little say about global framework and global institutions. And they have a lot of wars that nobody has paid much attention to. That is certainly a, a source of frustration um, that they seem, uh, they think that Ukraine has been treated differently because it is part of you. Do you think there'll ever be a reform of the UN Security Council? Do you think the P5 will ever allow P7? Or, I mean, this has been stuck, stuck, stuck for, yeah. you know, 70 plus years now. Well, just and, like and the world has been completely transformed. How can India, you know, not, not be a permanent member of the Security I'm Council? Sure, I'm I mean, sure the Commissioner will have, uh, will have uh, thoughts on this, but yeah. quickly. You know, we saw last, last week the uh, UN Secretary General, my, uh, my countryman Guterres, to say that he doesn't have power and he doesn't have money, which I think was kind of a significant moment where the UN no longer even pretends that it can have an important say in global affairs. Well, how can the P5 function uh, at a time of war in Europe when one of its members has a veto? I mean, it just doesn't, doesn't function. Anyway, Yuta, you wanted to um, 
say something. I'd, also, I'd like to, and perhaps you can weave this into your, what you're about to say. I, am, I imagine, I mean, you are the Commissioner for International Partnership, and I imagine that despite the um, interlude of the, the Trump years, uh, you, you view the United States as Europe's chief ally in um, defending, spreading democracy and liberal values in the world. How, how are your relations, the EU's relations with the United States today, would you say? Uh, and how effectively do you come together to, to uh, defend democracy at a time when it's seriously challenged? Of course, our relationship is very close. Uh, I mean, since the Biden administration took the power, we have been very in a very close contacts, and um, also in the middle of the COVID-19, we, we really coordinated our efforts in terms of um, vaccine donations, and, and, and uh, I would say also uh, we were coordinating how to support, for instance, in Africa, health systems and health infrastructure so that we would help them to vaccinate people from my perspective, so this is one example. But of course, uh, and then in terms of Ukraine, definitely very, very strong ally. Uh, also under the G7, I would say that the cooperation is uh, maybe uh, closer than ever at the moment. Uh, and, and G7 is a very united community. But then in terms of econ economy, of course, the US is also a competitor to the, to the European Union and, and to Europe and, and our member states and our companies. That's also, also a fact. But I wanted to comment this um, actually that um, why so many countries in the global south really uh, don't want to choose sides. And I think um, when we talk about the UN Charter, and, and sovereignty, it's very easy to, to get support from the Global South and it resonates quite well among them and we can see that also in the UN different uh, votes. But then I want to share one experience uh, with you which I had with one African leader because I meet leaders from Africa, Latin America, Asia every week. And I was having a dinner with one African leader and he asked me that Jutta, Normally, you know, we have this tradition with the European Union that you always tell us that you never uh, finance war economy. Then you always tell us that you never provide military equipment or, or guns. And then you always encourage us to come to the peace negotiations. So you really promote peace in each and every conflict. But now in, you, in the case of Ukraine, we see that the European Union is uh, funding war economy. We see that you are providing military equipment, including guns. And we see that you are not really actively promote peace in, and, or encourage uh, actors to, to come to the peace negotiations. And I think this is precisely also what resonates quite well in the Global South. That so they see that, you know, we, the European Union... What or do you the, say? How do you answer that question? That, that we have, in a way, the double standards. And you, say, I, you say we have a double standard? No, I say that, you know, this is uh, how they criticize well, us. What do you say when they say that? I say, I say, of course, that from our perspective, the first of all, we have a war in our European soil. And we definitely recognize and understand that so even, it's a though, of geography. Even, even though the war is taking place in our European soil, the consequences are global. And that's why we want to help our partners also in the global uh, south to face those consequences. But we also very much feel that Ukraine, Ukraine is not only fighting for itself, but it's also fighting for our values and our UN charter. And that's why we are, I would say, breaking the, the so dear principles we have been promoting uh, historically, that we are indeed funding the war economy and we are providing guns. And, and, and of course, we hope that we would see peace negotiations to start as soon as possible. But for us, it has to happen so that Russia, of course, leaves to Ukraine. I don't imagine your African interlocutors are too convinced by that. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, uh, for me, you know, I come from Finland, 
I come from a country which really yeah, doesn't well. have colonialist history. Uh, but I have to say that, in a way, we also have to understand that there are many historical reasons why certain African leaders really, they don't want to take sides. They mm. have been educated, yeah. for instance, in the former Soviet Union. Mm. Mm. Or then there are economic ties. Or then there are also this kind of a, uh, feeling that this war is about uh, West between uh, superpowers, so between West and East, between Russia and the US. So mm. it just, you know, we might not accept those arguments or their yeah. thinking, but I think it's important to try to understand, you know, what is behind their behavior. Yeah, well, I understand it, I think. Um, um, I'd like to drill down a little bit into this term, civilizational states, because its implication is a little bit that the West is not, these are not civilizational states, they are states based on principles, based on the idea that individual liberty and the rule of law and press freedom and human rights and certain principles are absolutely cardinal and central to giving individuals the possibility of finding fulfillment in their lives. So the implication of all these civilizational states rising is that we're, or the West is some other kind of state. I, I may be wrong. I mean, I live, I, I live in Paris, um, and when I look around, what I see is civilization. Uh, I see the beauty of the city, I see the harmony, I see the culture, uh, I see a lot of people on strike. Uh, I see yeah, the, univer the universalist ideas um, contained in the Declaration of the Rights of man, which was swiftly followed by the Declaration of the Rights of Women in, in France a couple of years later, however imperfectly realized. And I'm absolutely certain also as an American that American civilization uh, exists and culture, um, be it you know, a unique nation of immigrants, can-do society, the most open society in the world, the rugged individualism, to use the cliche, of Americans. This is something unique and new under the sun. This, this is a form of civilization and culture. So why, why are we calling these other countries civilizational states as if the West is not? Simon? Yeah. Well, maybe I've got it wrong. It's just such a strange term. No, I think, I think you're into something important. And, and, but just as a, as a short preface to this question about how do you defend democracy, which you asked a moment ago, you know, you don't defend democracy with guns. You can defend a democratic state with guns, but the defending of democracy happens many years before, and it happens in the way that we treat and value and use the institutions that we have. And so to this question you ask now about what is the civilizational component of our societies? Well, look, you know, we are the sum, and no more than the sum, of the quality of the institutions that we put together. And if you want to be able to give different people voice, which you need to do if you want to tolerate pluralism and to have pluralism and diversity, it doesn't happen just because you say we value pluralism and diversity. It happens because you take the effort and take the actions and accept some constraints upon your own patterning of behavior in order to make that happen. And so if we ask what is it that we have lost over recent decades, it surely comes down to some very simple things as well as some very big grand civilizational things. It comes down to things such as how was it that individuals came together to discuss their disputes before and to transmit those answers up to the political sphere, up to the parliaments. One answer was unions. Well, look at the US. Union rates in the US were about 35%, 30, 40 years ago. Now they're about 10%. So where is that channel of communication and dialogue, which we very quickly point to social media, we point to Fox News, certainly from the New York Times, you point to Fox News uh, as, as, as causing these problems, but they're merely exacerbating the fact that there is a lack of institutional conduits for real democratic behavior that actually then supports the democratic institutions that we want to keep. And I think that is a core part of the problem that we face because it's on us. And so it's easy to look to the civilizational states, it's easy to look to what's happening in China, to what's happening in Russia, 
it's much harder to take a look in the mirror and say, well, how is what's happening there a function of what's happening here? And you mentioned, you mean, mentioned you could, the Security you could Council. Call, you, you could use an, a different adjective. You could say, for example, repressive state. You could. So, you know, or nationalist states, or overtly nationalist states, or imperial states, which we have been as well. Mm. And you mentioned the P5. You know, part of the problem of the inability of the P3 to respond to what's happening now in Ukraine is what the P3 themselves did from 2001 onwards. Mm. It gave away the ability to speak from the moral high ground. Right. Uh, Ding Xin, so how do you... Uh I mean, I think we have about five minutes left. I mean, if anybody wants to ask a question, we could take maybe one or two questions. But how do you see the new balance in the world? You just said you're not worried by China's rise at all, that the U.S. will remain dominant. I mean, is that the way you... S do you see a different world order emerging with India's rise as well and uh, the rise of the global south? Uh, uh, or do you think the Western democratic model is safe and sound and nobody needs to worry about anything? No, actually it's not safe and sound. <laughs> you know. Tell us about that. Yeah, I sound think, uh, you know, uh, Western model, it's, uh, there's always certain problems. It just uh, happened to be 30 years ago, I uh, too optimistic. So I have uh, a few setbacks. I think the, set, the most serious setback is not from outside. It's actually from the United States. So uh, to me, the Western model has the two pillars for democracy. You know, it's, you have to keep a loyal opposition. In a way, the two parties share similar core values. Another is that democracy is only game in town. And the Trump administration, the president violated both. So that's really a crazy situation. Trump All, violated both. Yeah, yeah. So that's a the problem. Do you think he's coming back? I hope not. <laughs> you know? but I, did, I didn't ask you what you hope. I no, asked no, you no. what you think. There's, there's certain possibility. There's certain possibility that, you know, I think democracy is certainly face enemy from outside, but the main, the main enemy is from within. Do you think American democracy would survive four more years of Trump? Of course, you know, of course, you know, because well, the democracy, yeah, there's a, January 6th, yeah. Hmm. It didn't look, you know, yeah. it was quite threatening, <clears throat> you know, to, to me, say the least. If, I come back, if Trump come back, American democracy will face serious problems, but it won't run to situation like Weimar Germany. You have three parties really committed total different values, and only one party committed to democracy. And then you have, don't have liberal culture, you don't have a division of power between parliament, and the you know, United States had the institution is, you know, the sus can sustain this kind yeah, of Yeah, well, I mean, we could then have mm -hmm. Finland having joined NATO and the United States leaving it, so that would be... But that's... Yeah. Yeah. Um, we can take, we don't have much time, we could take, do you have a mic out there? There's a question there. And thank you. Uh, thank you for this very important retrospective on the process of democracy and the global context. I think there is a decade that was a bit over, underlooked in your panel, which is the one between 2001 and 2011. So on one side, the fact that a war wo was waived for democracy. And so my first question is if this had an impact on depowering the concept of democracy. And the other fact in that year was the G8 in Genoa and the fact that the social movements were uh, fought back, not exactly in a democratic way by assumedly democratic states. So I think when we look at the evolution of democracy, we shouldn't overlook to that. And at the same time, the Arab Spring in 2011, I think, gives a lens on other forms of democratic mobilization that were not exactly supported uh, by the so-called liberal democracies. So I think looking at the decade is quite important, and maybe also looking at alternative ways and integrative ways for funneling the democratic uh, trust of citizens that got, got back at the, under Ms. Dahl. Thank you. That's a lot to cover in 35 minutes, um, the Arab Spring, the world. But let's, um, do you want to say something, Simon, about that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, just very briefly, I think you, you make two really important things that are actually two sides of the same coin. One is that there's been a 
removal, as it were, of executives from the responsibility of the decisions that they take. And that's been a long secular trend that we've seen. And Iraq was one example of that. But we see it more broadly with, for example, uh, the independence of central banks, various ways in which traditionally from the Keynesian state background where government said, we will do these things, we will deliver, and you will judge us on whether we do, there's been a retreat back, except in the realm of the executive. And then the flip side of that is over the past few decades as well, we have seen a huge upwelling in civil society movements, in NGOs. You know, the 1970s was the breakthrough of social movements. Fantastic. But it channels that activism into a voluntarist frame, which takes it away from the commitments, the civic commitments that we want to see as citizens, that you see in civic lotteries and you see in other forms of practice that are now just beginning to emerge as a response to that very problem. And I think that decade that you mentioned, you know, the, post, you know, the, the crisis decade for civil liberties in, 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 the, in the UK, in the US, in Europe, that was really the function of those longer-term secular trends. So I'm really pleased that you, that you brought that up. Thank you. Um, yeah. There's, there's one question there, and I have one last question. Uh, could you... I can't see you really back there. I see a hand raised here. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Hi. A, a very brief question, very please. Very brief question. Yeah. Okay. So Winston Churchill said that democracy is the worst form of government but for all the rest. The question is, are, is the liberal international order going through a critical juncture, a moment of transformation, perhaps, that we could describe the end of the end of history? Thank you. Um, could, would you take that, please, Bruno? No, I, I think, uh, you, you know, it's not the end of the end of history because there was never any end of history. <laughs> uh, I mean, no one, no one really could take that seriously, and, uh, uh, even less now. But on the question of democracy, let me just make a quick comment. I'm not sure that democracy is in crisis. I, I think the Western model of democracy is in crisis. Uh, but we see all over the world different kinds of democracy developing. I was in Somaliland recently, vibrant democracy. Uh, we see Indonesia, we see Malaya. I could give you so many examples. But when democracy is where people don't have the vote. Hmm? Democracy is where people don't have the vote. Like w which example? No, I'm just. I mean just. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean there, are, there are many ways to organize a democracy with different structures, with different institutions, and we shouldn't make I mean, make China calls itself a democracy. China, let me say, uh, the Chinese regime is not a democracy, but it has some democratic elements right. as part of the regime. Uh, but uh, we can find democracies that are vibrant, more vibrant than Western democracies, and that don't follow the same model that we follow, and it would be a terrible mistake to accuse them of not being democracies just because those democracies look different. Right. I'd like to close with a question, a quick question to you. So all these different systems, fast-changing world, can they come together to address probably the overarching issue of our age, which is climate, climate change? Can there at least be cooperation on that? Because if this little planet dies, then there'll be no more Athens Democracy Forum, there'll be, there'll be no more anything. I hope so. I'm an optimistic. That's why I'm a politician, you know. <laughs> I became a politician because I wanted to change the world, and I believe that in the end, we are able to solve the climate change as well. Uh, to be very honest, it doesn't look very good for the COP28, but luckily, there will be also COP29 after that. So I think that even though there are many challenges in terms of climate, uh, I'm, I'm optimistic. Thank you all very much. Thank you.